Father, we bless your name because of your love. We thank you because of what you are doing in our time. Father, we bless your name because of this privilege we have to come and study your word today. Father, we're asking that the word of God will reach us at the point of our need today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Last week we studied about the life of Stephen as well as the ministry of Stephen. I pointed to you that Stephen was just an ordinary member of the church before he was chosen among the seven people to distribute the material needs in the church. But then we saw the spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the life of Stephen last Monday. And um, as we studied that, I said I was going to I was going to teach on the spiritual gifts in the church. Now in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, we're reading verses 3, 5, 8, and 15. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Verse 5. And the saint pleased the whole multitude, and he chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith, and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Verse 15, and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We can see in this member of the church, as well as a worker of the church, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in his life. And there is so much misunderstanding or ignorance concerning spiritual gifts in the church as it is revealed in the Bible. And this type of ignorance will lead to many erroneous views concerning what the church is and the place of the Holy Ghost in the church. That is why I am taking these few weeks to clear up in your mind spiritual gifts in the church. Now we do this for a number of reasons. Number one, I want you to see the biblical perspective, what the Bible says about the gifts of the Spirit. Number two, I want you to know when the gift is in manifestation in our church, to see that this is according to the Bible standard and Bible precept. Number three, to be able to detect the difference between the counterfeit and the genuine. Because you know that uh, if there is a genuine thing, there is also the counterfeit. And many times people do not realize the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. And uh, when people come to a midst, they may have questions on their minds whether what we're doing here is genuine or a counterfeit. And you as a member of the church, you'll be able to answer uh, because you know what the Bible says. Reason number four, why we're studying these. I want uh, people that already have the gifts of the Spirit. I want them to be able to identify the gifts in their lives so that they'll be able to make use of the gifts that God has given them in their lives. Number five, uh, there are people who do not have the gifts of the Spirit. But if they knew the truth about the gifts of the Spirit, they'll be able to receive those gifts. But, um, you know, when you are ignorant, you don't even know that that thing is available for you. 
you will not be able to see how you will reach into getting the gifts of the Spirit. Number six, another reason why we're studying this is um, uh, to know that when we have these gifts in the church, we see the various manifestations and operations of those gifts and we know how to manifest them. Uh, you know, the Corinthian church had the gifts of the Spirit, but they were all in confusion. All the gifts were present in their church. In fact, the Apostle Paul said they were not behind any other church in the gifts of the Spirit, but they needed three long chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, uh, to reveal to them how they will make use of the gifts. Now, it is true that uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about speaking in tongues and interpretations and prophecy, the vocal gifts or the gifts of inspiration. And that is because that was an area where they were misusing or not understanding the proper manifestations of the gifts. But there are churches where the other gifts are not being used properly. Now, it's because of all these reasons that I see that at this point in our study of the book of Acts, we need to get into a proper understanding of the gifts of the Spirit. And for some few Mondays, I'll be doing this to reveal to you from the pages of the Bible what we have as a benefit from the Holy Ghost for the church. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I am reading verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. That is very clear that if we're New Testament church, if we're Bible-based church, if we're church wanting to follow the Lord every, every step of the way, there is something we must never be ignorant of, and it is concerning spiritual gifts. The Apostle Paul told this church that if they were ignorant about any other thing, this is number one thing they must not be ignorant of as a church. Well then, the churches today who say that they do not want to care about what the Bible says on the spiritual gifts, they are missing something. And there is a flagrant direct disobedience to what we have read here because it says concerning spiritual gifts brethren I would not have you ignorant let me tell you this whenever the apostle Paul said he did not want uh, people to be ignorant of a particular thing it was an important thing he was talking about number two he was talking to brethren let me just show you Romans chapter 11 verse 25 for I would not brethren that ye should be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in you know, the Abrahamic covenant had been given, and it was a standing covenant, a great covenant. The Davidic covenant had been given. It was a wonderful, great covenant, and the new covenant had also been given. And all related to the coming of the Messiah and what the Messiah, the Christ, will do for Israel. Now, blindness came on the children of Israel for a time because of their ways of living, because of their rejection. And the Gentiles came in. And the Gentiles were already thinking that the whole church is just for the Gentiles. The grace of God is only for the Gentiles. And this was an important dispensational truth about the plan of God, about the ways of God, and about the goal God had for the whole nation of Israel. And uh, the apostle said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery very important, very great, and they must not be ignorant about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. 
in verse uh, 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. And in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Listen to me. Paul the Apostle said again, to these people, there is something on my mind, very weighty, very important, and I do not want you to be ignorant about it. Again, he said, brethren. Which means that if the Holy Ghost is not calling us back to real proper understanding, there are some important truths we'll be misunderstanding, we'll be ignorant of. And he was talking about the dealings of God with the children of Israel as they pass through the wilderness. That if you're ignorant of this, you might be careless. If you're ignorant of this, you may not be really conversant with the dealings of God as it relates to your relationship, as it relates to your eternal destiny. You may start on the race, and you may not be able to finish appropriately because you are ignorant of something. So he said, moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant of this, that so that you will not lose the value, the teaching of the examples were given in the Old Testament. Now, I've read to you in Romans a dispensational truth, very, very important, they must not be ignorant of. I read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a particular truth they must not be ignorant of. Come with me, 2 Corinthians. I'm reading chapter 1, in verse 8. For we would not, brethren, now can you see this? Every time the apostle is saying, don't be ignorant, don't be ignorant, he always said, brethren. You know, it's not only the sinners that can be ignorant, but even the brethren, those who are born again, those who are children of God, if we're not careful, will be ignorant of an important truth. Verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life, for but we are the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver, and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Listen to me. Paul the Apostle said there was something he did not want them to be ignorant of. And actually, you know, the emphasis of it is in verse 10. In the past, he delivered us. Past tense. In that same verse, in the present, he does deliver us. Today, in the future, he will yet deliver us. How important that is. That in the past, in the present, in the future, we should not trust in ourselves, but we should trust in God. Whatever the trouble may be, you may be pressed out of measure. Don't be ignorant of this, that we apostles, we have passed through such a great trouble, but the past, present, future uh, promises of God, they avail even until today. And it says, brethren, do not be ignorant of that. Now, 1 Thessalonians, I'm reading chapter 4, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Can you see that? Every time, every time, whenever he says, I will not want you to be ignorant, he always addresses that to the brethren. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also, um, also, uh, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, hinder them, which are asleep. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with his shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, again, it was an important truth concerning the rapture, concerning the hope of those who have, been, who have died already. And so whenever the Apostle Paul was referring to something very significant, very important, very great, he said, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. And so we can see the importance of spiritual gifts. The apostle did not want them to be uh, ignorant of dispensational truths that Israel will still have a time God will face them and show them his grace. He did not want them to be ignorant of the examples we have in the Old Testament so that we will not fall by the wayside. He did not want them to be, uh, to be ignorant of the fact that God delivered in the past, he is delivering in the present, he will deliver in the future. He did not want them to be ignorant of the fact that we shall be caught up when the Lord will come in the rapture. And also, he did not want them to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. Now, the questions are these. What are spiritual gifts? How many are they? For what purpose are these gifts to play in the life of individuals and in the life of the church? What is the difference between the spiritual gifts and the natural talents? Now, as we look at these questions, I'll see the classification of the gifts, the clarification on the gifts, the consecration for the gifts to receive, and then the confirmation through the gifts. Now, what are the classifications? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with them. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discerning of spirits. To another, diverse different kinds of tongues, languages. And to another, the interpretation of tongues, of languages. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now these are the gifts of the spirit that the Apostle Paul said by the Holy Ghost that the brethren the church must not be ignorant of. And I'm going very slowly so that uh, those who are not familiar with these things will be able to catch what we're saying. And these gifts are nine in number as they are listed in the passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As we said, they are nine. For the purpose of study, we divide them into three groups. Three times three is nine. Three first, another three making six, another three making nine. Now you understand, when we talk about uh, the classification and the different things, check up, for example, in your own body. You have more than 263 bones in your body. And these bones are related together, they are joined together in such a way that your body is able to function in a proper way. But you see, these bones have their classifications. They do not all look alike. Some are longer than the others. Others are shorter. Now, sometimes people are asking, which is the most important spiritual gift? 
Well, the question is, which is the most important bone in your body? We cannot tell. All the bones in your body are important because, you see, when you miss out one, you are incapacitated. In, in the human body, for example, there are some things you will never be able to learn except you will see it. There are some things you will never be able to understand well and grasp well except you will hear. And there are some things you will not be able to really fully appreciate except you can smell it. There are some things that will be strange to you except you can feel it with your hand. Therefore, when you think about the knowledge that man has, uh, you know, all over the world, you think about how we learn. It's either by taste, and you can classify some things that you know, you understand, when you taste this thing, or it is by touch, or it is by hearing, or it is, you know, by smelling, or it's uh, by seeing. So you see all these classifications are there. Now, people are asking, which is the most important? Is it, you know, the smell, or the taste, or the touch, or the hearing, or the seeing? Well, the point is, if you have all the rest of the faculties, and you don't have the sight, you cannot see, even though you can smell, you can taste, you can touch, and you can hear, but you cannot see. Uh, do you know that there are some things you'll never be able to do? The same thing, if you may, maybe you have all the other faculties, but the only thing is that uh, you don't have any sense of smell at all. You don't, uh, there is no sense of smell. You're never able to smell anything. There are some things you'll not be able to learn. I'm telling you something, that the spiritual gifts are so important. And even though they are classified into these uh, three groups of threes, uh, if you miss one out in a church, I don't mean an individual, but in a church, there are some things that church will not be able to get at. And as I studied with you, the spiritual gifts, uh, these nine spiritual gifts, you'll see the significance of what I am teaching tonight. Now, how are they classified? The first thing, they work with revelation. That is, you're either hearing something, seeing something, knowing something. And it's uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits. All those uh, gifts relate with knowing something. It's revealed to you. Either you see it, or you hear it, or you know it. It is given to you by inspiration. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, word of uh, and uh, discerning of spirits. These are the gifts of revelation. Now, the next group. You see, these, they look alike. That's why we, we group, group them together. The next group, faith, the gifts of healing, and the working of miracles. Now, you understand. Whenever we're talking about faith, about healing, about miracles, we're talking about power. And that is why these are called power gifts, or the gifts to act, the gifts of action. Where these gifts are, there is action. Somebody is getting healed, is, uh, is lame, and therefore he's healed now, he's running and jumping. Or, uh, you know, the sea has been very stormy, a miracle has taken place, it is now calm. Or uh, the sun is moving on, but now there is a, a decree of faith, and it is stopping right where it is. These are the gifts that relate with action and with power. Faith, healing, miracle. Now, the next, three, uh, the next three gifts that form a group will refer to these as the vocal gifts or the gifts of inspiration. Prophecy, you have to say something in prophecy. So, you are making use of your voice. We call, we call it a vocal gift or the different kinds of tongues, of languages that are spoken given by the inspiration of God. That is a vocal gift, or it is the interpretation of tongues. So then, these are the gifts, and this is the classification. Three groups, and uh, there are three gifts in each group. Now, uh, as we say that these are, three, uh, these are gifts, we're studying about the life of Stephen. 
Come back to chapter 6 again. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. Let me remind you of some of these gifts in the church. And in a member now that we're looking at, that member is Stephen. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now listen to me. Now, they were looking for men full of the Holy Ghost. In the original, those people were so given to the Holy Ghost, so yielded to the Holy Ghost that the attributes and the gifts of the Holy Ghost will be manifested in their lives. And it says they should be men of honest report. Why? Because, you see, the Holy Ghost is gentle, holy, loving, and he works best when you are holy, gentle, and loving. And you know, it's not enough to just say, well, I want the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You must create an environment. Now, let me show you this. A man may have the proper gifts and the proper talent to work in a workshop, in a motor mechanic workshop. If the environment is all right, the tools are there, he'll be able to work. But you know, if somebody is making fire near that workshop, and there is smoke, and uh, his eyes are, you know, watering because of the smoke, and he's feeling inconvenient in his stomach, in his lungs, and he's feeling inconvenient in his nose because of the smell of the smoke, and because of the irritation of the smoke in his eyes. Even though he may have the qualification, he'll not be able to be his best in working. And you know that immorality, sin, evil, is like a smoke in the nostrils of the Lord. And the Holy Ghost, the third person, the Trinity, if he comes to inhabit you, if that uh, honesty is not there, that holiness is not there, that life of a uh, Christian living is not there, that is not creating a good environment for the Holy Ghost to work. That is why whenever you are talking about the gifts of the Spirit, you must also be talking about the fruit of the Spirit so that you can create a good environment for the Holy Ghost to work. So they were looking for men of honest report, men who are members of the church, men among us, and these should be full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Look at verse 8. We're told about Stephen, particularly, and Stephen, full of faith. I told you one of the gifts is faith and power. I told you power, uh, sorry, I told you faith is one of the power gifts and he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you see something there? Grouping those gifts together? Faith, wonders, miracles, under power, that's why we group those things together. Because even in the Bible, you can see it very, very clearly that there are some gifts that go together. And depending upon the personality and the call and the uh, purpose of God for each individual, some of the gifts may be manifesting in your life and some other gifts may not be manifesting in your life because of the purpose of your call and because of the intention of God for your life. But then look at verse and they were not able to receive the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. That's another gift that manifested at another time in his life. And we're told that they were not able to resist him. If he was only human, they'll be able to resist him. But because this is now in the realm of the supernatural, that is why they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, I've told you about the gifts. And I've told you they are nine in number, as they're listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me talk to you about the clarification on the gifts. That is, I want to give you an indication of each of the gifts, what they stand for, what they really are, so that you can see the differences between them. Now listen to me. As we're looking at all these things, uh, that doesn't mean uh, you'll say, that's what I prefer. 
because you know you cannot tell which one you prefer it's just like um, take an individual for example in the church the organist he plays the organ with his hands but will he be able to use his hands if he were blind no sir he needs his eyes as an organist but you know he has the hands he has the eyes is that not enough for him in um, in playing the organ no sir he needs his ears because he wants to know when he is uh, sometimes uh, just playing away the music and he's tracking the wrong note it is when he he listens to what he's playing with his ears that he's able to give us a good harmonious music but you know if he's using a pedal organ and even when you see electric organ, he needs his legs to be able to sometimes increase the volume or sometimes lower the volume of what he's playing. Uh, do you know that he needs even his neck? Because if he's not able to bend the neck and if he has any pain in his neck, it disturbs his playing very seriously. It, it handicaps him. I'm telling you something. that You know, you see a man that is playing the organ and you're asking yourself, uh, what gifts will he need? What members of the body will he need? Well, he needs his hands, he needs his legs, he needs uh, his nose to be able to breathe normally because, you know, as he continues to breathe, then he's able to continue doing whatever he's doing. We laymen, we think that, well, if that man has, you know, good hands that are well trained, he can play that organ at any time. Not like that. The same thing, the gifts of the Spirit in the church. Now, the pastor may say, well, uh, this is all I need. I don't need all the other things. Or the teacher of the word of God may say, this is all I need. I don't need all the other things. Or it may be an evangelist that will say, this is all I need. I don't need the other things. Well, the gifts are all important. And we cannot overlook any of the gifts. We need to have a proper understanding of what the gifts are and also the appropriate ways of making use of the gifts of the Spirit. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, let's see what these gifts are. I'll give you a definition of the gifts. And then I'll give you an example or two examples of each of the gifts. Verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now look up at me here. Knowledge is different from wisdom. Knowledge is the fact that you have in your hand. Wisdom is what to do with the facts you have in your hand to the advantage of the church and to the profit of the individual. Now, if you have knowledge, that knowledge may puff you up. That knowledge may even ruin the church. That knowledge may destroy the church. But if you have wisdom, you apply the knowledge and you use the wisdom aright. Now, when we say a spiritual gift, a spiritual gift is a gift given by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of God, without any natural channel. Listen to me. It's a gift given by the Holy Ghost without any natural knowledge. Now, you have heard the story before. An ass was carrying a man called Balaam. And uh, this ass turned out of the way. Balaam couldn't understand. And Balaam beat that ass. And that ass began to do something that animals do not normally, generally, naturally do. That is supernatural. Number one, that animal saw an angel with a sword that is drawn. That is a gift given at that time without a natural channel. And when, when he saw the angel, God also gave him, gave the, sorry, the animal, the intelligence to turn out of the way. That, um, that ass knew, this angel with a drawn sword is not a friend, it's an enemy, it's an adversary. He has come because of judgment. And when Balaam beat that ass, that ass began to speak in the language of man. 
that goes beyond the speeches of the animal, the group of the animal. The animal doesn't normally do that. And that was the only time that animal did that. It was a supernatural sin. It wasn't a natural sin. That's why I said the spiritual gift is something given by the Spirit of God without going through the normal, natural, earthly channel. And when you think about that, if God can do that for an animal, he can give his spiritual gifts to his own children. I was talking about the word of wisdom. Now, you know, uh, for example, you may have revelation because uh, wisdom, knowledge, the sign of spirits are all uh, the gifts of revelation. Let's say, for example, as I come here on Thursday and I, and I have knowledge that somebody is having difficulty, that uh, as he's having that difficulty, he's having the difficulty because he has gone to commit ad adultery with another man. And uh, that is why uh, maybe she's having this problem with barrenness and pregnancy and whatever it is. And I said, you are there. You know, sometimes the Lord may even reveal the name of such a person. Now, that's the word of knowledge. I have the knowledge. I know the name. I know that individual. I know where the person is sitting. I may even know that, don't be ashamed, your husband may be here tonight. Your husband is even sitting in another. I may have all that knowledge. And I say, raise up your hand. Everybody close your eyes. Now, the people who, if I mention the name, the people having their wives bearing that name, they are not going to close their eyes. Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? And they're going to be watching for the women that are going to raise up their hands. And then they raise up their hands and I pray. And I have manifested the gift of the word of knowledge without the gift of the word of wisdom. And they go back home and they begin to fight. And uh, you know, that man may almost kill that woman because you have got the gift of the word of knowledge without the gift of the word of wisdom. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, sometimes I say, uh, the Lord reveals to me, and I say, well, there are people there, you are still wet in the bed, and I say, lady there, the age, and I give the age, and sometimes it's 26 or 27. And suppose I didn't tell people to close their eyes, and I say, well, just raise up your hand where you are, and um, the people raise up their hands, and then I pray. And uh, there is a brother who has seen the will of God towards, uh, you know, that sister. And he opened his eyes and he saw, uh, uh. so, sister, so and so still wet in the bed. I'm so sorry, this thing is not the will of God. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you something, that sometimes the gift of the Spirit, if you do not know how to manifest, if you don't know how to really help the church and build the church, the gifts you say you have can ruin and destroy the church and destroy the individuals but you know wisdom the gift of the word of wisdom is the one that shows you how to apply the knowledge and it is given in a supernatural way i gave you examples last week let me remind you two women came to solomon and uh, they wanted to know uh, which uh, mother actually had a living child because one of them had slept on her own child and the child was dead. And so uh, Solomon said, bring me a sword. He didn't mean to kill that child. But that was the wisdom given to him supernaturally. At that time, later I'll be telling you how, to, how you will know that God is giving it to you. How you'll be able to differentiate between just your mind and the spirit of God. Between the human spirit and the Holy Spirit. But for now, I'm just clearing up for you what the gifts are. And then when he said that, the one that is the real mother, the bowels yearned and said, No, Solomon, don't do that. Give the child to her. The other woman said, Oh yes, kill the child divide the child and so you understand the word of wisdom will help in helping us to know what to do with the knowledge we have let's go on how about the gift of the word of knowledge well knowledge is revealing facts to you you've seen that on Thursdays whenever you've come here knowledge is something I couldn't have known because nobody told me and um, while we're praying, the Lord will give that knowledge. It is his knowledge. Only God knew that thing. And then, uh, because it's given to the minister, the minister will reveal it. That is called the gift of the word of knowledge. 
Now, it's the word of knowledge because it is not all the knowledge of God. God will never give you all his knowledge. Never. But he will give you a small bit of his knowledge that is needed at that particular time. And he will give it to you in a supernatural way. Let me remind you that Saul was looking for some asses. And uh, he, he came and he was asking for Samuel. And he saw Samuel and he said, uh, uh, Can you show me the seer, the prophet? And Samuel said, I am. And before Saul could ever talk, Samuel said, Now, the three asses who are looking for, they had been found. That's knowledge. And that is the gift of the word of knowledge. And he said, now you go to the high table, I'll be sitting with you, and I'll be telling you everything on your mind. That's the gift of the word of knowledge. You remember sometimes that Elisha, the man of God, he had a servant called Gehazi. And this Gehazi followed Naaman, and he went to take something he shouldn't have taken, and he came back and he hid that thing. And... Um, Elisha said, where are you coming from? He said, thy servant went no whither. I didn't go. I've been here all the time. And the man of God said, did not my spirit go with you? Is this the time to receive uh, changes of raiment and these things? You see, he had the knowledge. That's the gift of the word of knowledge. And uh, you remember Ananias and Sapphira. The, uh, and has brought something to the apostles and uh, Peter said is this all he said yes that is all and Peter without interviewing anybody without asking any question he said why has Satan filled your heart that's the gift of the word of knowledge how about discerning of spirits now, discerning of spirits is not imagination. You know, some people have the gift of suspicion. And everybody, almost everybody has that one. Husband suspecting the wife and saying, I have the gift of discernment. Anytime the, the wife goes to the market and, you know, spends an hour, one and a half hours, he says, well, I just know I have the gift of discernment, uh, the gift of suspicion. And when the woman comes back and uh, the husband will say, where have you gone? Don't you know I have the gift? That's imagination. That's suspicion. God doesn't want you to have that gift. He wants you to bury that gift. And you know that you don't have to pray to have the gift of suspicion. You don't have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost to have the gift of suspicion. In fact, I know many, many sinners that have the gift of suspicion. Two people are laughing together and you come and you say, well, they are talking about me. Because, you know, I have the gift of discernment. Not, no, sir. That is imagination. That is suspicion. Uh, you know, the gift of the discerning of spirits is not discerning... Human beings is discerning spirits. Let me give you some examples. Elisha woke up one day and uh, some army soldiers surrounded the place where he lived. They came for him. But you know he wasn't worried because he saw something that the servants did not see. That is discernment of spirits. He had seen those spirits in the spirit world, in the spirit realm. He knew that the chariots of fire were surrounding him. You know, we read the promises of God as uh, the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the angel of the Lord encamped, encamped around them that fear the Lord. But you know, if you do not have the discerning of spirits, you will not see them. You will not know that they are there. You just believe by faith. You just claim it that as the uh, mountains surround Jerusalem, the angels are around us. But when you have the discerning of spirits, you'll be able to know that uh, uh, they are there. You'll see them. And so Elisha, this uh, young man, woke up and said, Ah, my father, what shall we do? They have come to take us. Our lives will go. And uh, Elisha just prayed to the Lord in his sentence and he said, Lord, open his eyes that you will see that greater are they with us than those people. And the Lord opened the eyes of that servant. When the eyes were opened, he saw the chariots of fire all around them. Now, when God opens your eyes 
to see the angels all around the spirits all around good spirits not evil spirits now good spirits that is part of discerning of spirits you will know you will see you will understand now you know sometimes you are in a church and somebody rises up in the congregation and as he rises up in the congregation he he might be shaking and doing some things now some of the ushers might go there and just grab that individual carry him and sometimes that individual has no evil spirit that individual may not even be moved by the Holy Spirit. It may just be the human spirit that is shaking him. You know, he has been shaking like that in his church before. And whenever the preacher said something that, you know, struck him, that is very, very inspirational, he will just rise up and begin to shake in the former church. And, you know, the preaching is going on and God is walking and it's so wonderful. It touched him to the marrow of his bone. And he just rose up, not evil spirit, not Holy Spirit, and he began to shake. With the, with the human spirit and the ushers will go there carry him and you know rough and do him take him to a place they are praying for him to evil spirit for evil spirit to come out and you know there will be confusion but you know when we have the discerning of spirits ushers I'm not saying you should not do your work you are just, you are just wonderful people. This is just teaching session. Uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes um, when there are things like that going on, and if you do not have the gifts of the spirit, you will not understand how to deal with the case. Now, sometimes somebody is talking something that is wonderful, something that is good. Let me show you this. Acts of the Apostles, chapter sixteen, verse sixteen. Let me read verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, when you examine that message given by that lady, it was a wonderful message. Wonderful message. You know, she, he just followed Paul and the rest of the apostles. And he was publicizing them, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Is that not a true statement? Wasn't Paul and these people, were they not servants of the Most High God? They were servants of the Most High God. Which show unto us the way of salvation. That's good doctrine. And you know, in many churches, there are, there are some ladies having some types of spirits, familiar spirits, spirits of divination, evil spirits, and they know the doctrine, they know the word of salvation, they know the servants of God, they are very respectful, and you know, they'll come to the ministers and to the pastors, and they'll say, well, I, I just love the message of this church. I accept you as the servant of the Most High God, showing unto us the way of salvation. And you know that lady will become a worker in that church. And yet, when you have the discerning of spirits, you will know that there is something beyond just what the woman is saying, what the lady is saying, what that young man is saying. You'll be able to say, stop right there, evil spirit, come out in the name of Jesus. And it will come out. Now, Look at verse 16. And it came to pass. As we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by so saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that same hour. You see that? You know, you wouldn't pray if you didn't have the design of spirits in such a case. I'll not be able to finish the outline today. Um, I've been deliberately so, slow so you can understand. Did you understand all I've been telling you tonight? Now, let me talk to you a little on casting out devils. 
You know, in a particular meeting, there was a person that had demon possession. And uh, this uh, individual had been there before the meeting, about 4.30. There were many of the brethren that were uh, battling and praying and saying, come out, you evil spirit, you devil, come out, you devil, come out. And um, the evil spirit did not come out. These uh, people were about age, and they were students from a Bible college. And they would use their Bible. They'll beat that woman and then run back. And uh, they, they say, come out in the name of Jesus and then run back. And they, another person will go there, come out in the name of Jesus and then run back. And um, before the meeting, the man of God that was to take that meeting that night, he came before the meeting started. Eight strong young men, they were holding this woman. And um, they were battling, sweating. And that a woman with a supernatural evil power will just do like that and everybody will scatter. Then he'll beat her and run back. But this man of God, who was to preach the message that night, he came along and he saw them as they were battling. And he went through. He didn't pray. He just uh, got near that woman having evil, very, very violent. And he whispered something in the ears of that, of that demon-possessed person and then left and went away. And that woman calmed down, was not violent anymore, and then, uh, you know, just uh, sat up and brushed her clothes, went to sit down and got ready for the message of the day. And when the salvation message was given, she came for the altar call and she was saved. So uh, one of those uh, people that were there who saw what happened went to that man of God and said, what happened? Because eight believers beating this woman with the Bible and running back, they could not cast out the devil. They shouted the name of Jesus. They did this. They did that. What happened? How did you, what did you say to that woman that made her to come down like that? And the man of God said, I just whispered into her ears that I am the evangelist, I am so and so, I'm around. And I went back. He didn't pray, he didn't shout, he just wanted the devil to know I am the evangelist here, I'm in charge, I am around, I am so and so, and he went back. And the devil went away. And that woman became calm. And that woman sat down and listened to the message of that day. And God said, when the power is there, we don't need a lot of noise making. When the power is there, we don't need a lot of sweating. When the power is there, we do not need, you know, beating somebody with the Bible and running back. We just say in the name of Jesus and the devil will come out. Rise up and let us pray. In all these Mondays, I'll be teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. I want you to just come with a ready mind, an attentive heart, a willing heart, and I believe the Lord will be blessing you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are not saved, give yourself to the Lord. If you are not sanctified, give yourself to the Lord. If you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, you tell the Lord. And if you are looking for how to be more effective in your Christian service, look up to the Lord and the Lord will bless you in a mighty way.